I started to walk up to 16 miles a day, same path, same time, as a way to reorient to my surroundings, but also as a way for others to reorient around to me. There's a meditative quality about it. There's joy, there's pain, there's confusion, there's desire. I am feeling a diverse range of emotions. I'm learning fear. I had tears in my eyes because I felt that the impact of what I was observing and witnessing was very important to the community members, to the stories from the past. As this project points out, we are broken, we are divided. It is all the more important that we work on repairing that past to support a better future. The Conversation Series, Stitching the Geopolitical Quilt to Rebody Belonging, is an art and social justice work that uh, celebrates and confronts resilience, heritage, justice, and hope. It is my way of stitching the country back together. I felt like it was an assault on my body as a black male. I am a suspect and that I am to be feared. They don't believe that there is a space for safety or that safety is real. There are many who are ready for something different. This work is rooted in reorientating to understand the greater fabric of who we are and who we can be. The Conversation Series, Stitching the Geopolitical Quilt to Rebody Belonging, is about coming into communities and hearing what it means for each community member to be a part of that community, um, what it means for them to belong. In many ways, it is a call to action in and of itself. It will yield multiple outcomes as a result of working in and with communities. There will be new choreographies, there will be a feature-length documentary film, a digital humanities archives, and the ways in which we're working in and with the community, a diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice toy kit. A toy kit is different than tool kit because tool implies to fix and I'm not coming to the work as a fixer, nor do I hold that this work can fix anything, but it can be a portal to make the kinds of changes that we want to make. The Systems for Care and Repair are a series of community engagements and they, they have lots of different shapes. It is a menu, I refer to it as a menu, of options uh, that consist of a combination of discussions, talks, um, and embodied workshops. For individuals to meet the work and the content of the work at the point at which they can. We're coming in to receive this, these different ways of being in these communities and, and really metabolizing it through art. When people get, you know, stuck in issues, we feel like artists are great at getting folks unstuck and seeing things in a new way that opens up their minds, opens up their hearts, which oftentimes statistics don't achieve. We had a moment where a community member uh, confronted another community member over a long time ago past event that happened that we're she felt that there was racism put against her. And that moment was a moment of um, great intensity for all the people in the room and also opened the door for healing and connection and a true apology and hopefully a way forward for those two parties to coexist in the community together moving forward. A gift of doing this work has been to experience and be a witness to community, being able to see relationships change, 
new relationships form. It has allowed us to share stories in very real, um, genuine, heartfelt ways that have allowed people to listen and open their eyes to one another. That's just the start to what the walk together looks like as we move forward and continue the growth and healing that has been started um, by the conversation series and Hellenius' work in Lafayette. I feel like we need this project now more than ever because again, we're seeing the political divide of our country get to be like, just canyons and canyons and canyons apart from each other. Are the ways that we're inhabiting this space we call the United States really working? What are the ways we can actually f start to figure out how it can work for more people and specifically for marginalized groups of people who we desperately need to bring to the forefront? I believe that this work can be a spark to transform communities. How can I create a spark for more people to lean into curiosity, for more people to have the audacity to hope? for more people to want to understand how we can create a space to bring the past, present, and future together to grapple with it. My name is Luis Martirano. I'm the executive director here at Redline. Thank you all for being here today. It has always been our tradition to have a conversation um, to support the Dr. King holiday. And we don't necessarily know what it's going to be until we get close to that date because we know it's always going to come from the community and it's really going to be driven through artists, ideas, and their voices. Um, I want to ask, who was here last year for the Mile 17 conversation? Hooray! Well, welcome back. Uh, we are so lucky to go on this journey with Hellenius and his Creation Fund grant from the National Performance Network and really a state-wide, uh, uh, countrywide conversation about stitching the geopolitical quilt to rebody belonging, which Hellenius will share with you. Uh, his connection with Redline is really one about relationship and relationship building. And so we are continuing to do that and trying to honor Dr. King on this important holiday by yet again bringing a relationship together that has been sown this year through Hellenius and then, of course, John B. Smith, a civil rights leader, a black power leader from the invaders that we get to fortunately have this conversation today between the two of them and hear from you and your questions. So let me be the first to welcome up Helenius J. Wilkins. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm going to invite you to stand up and do something with me. So I'm going to introduce you to three gestures. Here's the first gesture. Can we all do that? 
And the second gesture involves starting behind your heads and tracing around to cover your eyes and then separating your hands to expose your eyes and then giving yourself a hug, sort of. Sort of. Because you're going to go to your heart. <laughs> it's a little trick in there. One more time to your ear. Tracing behind. Revealing the eyes. And the little hug that actually goes to the heart. And Hellenius does things in threes. So here's our third time. And here's the context for all what you're doing. So here we go. Listening. Listening allows us to see new perspectives. So that our hearts can expand. Thank you for joining me. There is no social justice without the body. And so what I just invited you to do is the movement manifesto for the conversation series, Stitching the Geopolitical Quilt to Rebody Belonging. And everywhere I travel, uh, alongside my duet partner, Avery Ryder Turner, we engage the community in doing this practice. So by the mere fact of us doing this practice in different places, we are connected in some way, shape, or form to individuals that we do not know. Thank you so much for joining us today for mile 18. Um, I always lean into everything with gratitude, and there's so much gratitude I have for you all being in this room today and being a part of this conversation. The conversation series, Stitching the Geopolitical Quilt to Rebody Belonging, might I add, it's a really long title. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you figured that out. And I am committed to always saying the full title because social justice is not easy. It doesn't roll off the tongue. It doesn't happen like magic. It takes a really long time. It requires patience. It requires commitment. It requires a willingness to stay the course. And so by creating a long title, it was my vision to create an invitation to invite you to be patient with yourself and to take the time to say the title. And so since I like audience participation, I'll have you say that title. The Conversation Series. Stitching the geopolitical quilt. Stitching the geopolitical quilt. To rebody belonging. To belonging. Today's conversation is an opportunity to remember, uplift, and honor Dr. King's legacy while also shining a light on how his visions and practices are still alive today and how it is being realized through the work of individuals of this generation and the social change actions that are taking place. I cannot think of him without a feeling of hope being invoked or recalling his many inspiring and poetic words and ways of action. I do believe that he was onto something when he said, we must either learn to live together as brothers or we are all going to perish as fools. I am holding today's event as an opportunity to engage in conversation about belonging and dreaming of a different future, but even more as a portal, a vessel for connection, sparking ideas, and inspiring one another to keep leaning into work of change and becoming better ancestors. For today's event, I have the great fortune of uh, sitting and talking with a brilliant individual, um, John D. Smith. And this bio, short bio that I'm going to read, to offer just a glimpse of his background 
is really like a tiny, tiny, tiny glimpse. Um, he's really an amazing individual. John B. Smith began as a black power advocate in 1967 and now works for social change, social justice, and other progressive causes. He's a writer, a black power advocate, and community organizer, hailing from Memphis, but currently based in Atlanta. He holds a BA in psychology and is the author of the 400th, 1916 to 2019, From Slavery to Hip Hop. This book was also published by the River House Publishing in 2021. It is my privilege to welcome John B. Smith. <laughs> Different place. Yeah. <laughs> Different from sitting at the table last night. <laughs> yeah. But I'd really like to thank you, uh, Louise and Redline, for inviting me to come and talk to this lovely audience you have. Thank you. I have so much gratitude for you as well. Um, it's a tremendous honor uh, to be in time and space with you. Um, I feel like we're starting our path of being friends for a long time. There's some work to be done yes, <laughs> together. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, because of this today's conversation happening on Dr. King's day, and you knew Dr. King personally, um, I'm wondering, um, as a starting off in a dreaming space, if you could have a, a conversation with Dr. King right now, what do you think your conversation would be about? I like your theme of, you know, re-embodying belonging because Dr. King really wanted to make everyone feel that they were a part of the same world. He did things that we might look at as very heroic and but from my conversation with him he saw himself more as an ordinary person trying to do things that will help ordinary people so uh, his conversation today would be about young people because that was his conversation uh, with him. in 98, it was about the need to bring young people into our conversation uh, about rights and belonging to the American society as one and not as separate groups. So I don't think his conversation would change. Yeah. When I hear you speak about him being an ordinary person, I often think about leaders as being ordinary people with extraordinary visions, right? Yes. Um, and there's also a way in which leaders uh, get built up in our world in certain kinds of ways. And so um, from my conversation last night, and then again, I, I was doing some reflection on that. Last, just last week, I was at a leadership uh, retreat, and I never told you this. <laughs> and uh, part of this retreat involved um, receiving some assessments that I had taken prior to going. Okay. And uh, these assessments were just to speak about our leadership strengths. And um, for this particular one, there were four focal points. And my two highest points was that I was a lover and a warrior. And the translation for that is that I, as a leader, I'm invested in relations, and I'm about getting the work done while protecting. Right. And based on what you share with me about what you knew about Dr. King, mm -hmm. I suspect that maybe he was a lover and a warrior too. Uh, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit about what made him different from other leaders in your. Well, Dr. King. born into a middle-class existence. He was uh, raised in a way that 
made him echelon. He went to the best schools. He uh, worked with people on very high level. But over time, I didn't see from the conversation he came before as being outside of America's society. And he wanted them to belong as he belonged. So what he did was identify with those who didn't have his advantages, those in our society who were like the sanitation workers who he came to Memphis to uh, help during the sanitation strike. And that was very different from other civil rights leaders. Other civil rights leaders saw themselves as go-betweens between the white society and, and the black society. And they felt that whatever concessions the society made, then they would get those concessions first. And once they got what they needed out of it, anything left, then they gave that to the rest of the society. And, but Dr. King, on the other hand, didn't ascribe to that, which is why he uh, launched the Poor People's Campaign. Other civil rights leaders looked at him and he said that they charged him with uh, betraying his class because he had put the poor before the middle class and they didn't want to participate in the Poor People's Campaign because they didn't see how the middle class was going to gain anything from it. So we, today, unless you really knew and studied him, didn't realize that at his, uh, the point of him launching the campaign, uh, the Poor People's Campaign, that he really chose the poor over the yeah. middle class. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so interesting because I feel like that's part of the struggle that's happening right now. Yes, today. Yeah, as we are we're thinking about what does it mean for justice and justice yes. for all, it's really like how do we get across the class lines yes. and really deal with those who are marginalized or are the poor. I agree, I agree, yeah. I agree. Do you feel that some of the same strategies are of the past or that you've experienced would be strategies that are maybe useful today to continue that fight uh, to create this greater space of justice? I've, I've, I'm often um, a thinker that experience as a great teacher. Yes. Um. If we look at society today and what's happening in it, the parallel is the 1930s and the 1940s. And what we fought to change and to make difference uh, in the 1960s is really back staring us in the face today because there's not a desire on leaders part to do what you talk about, which is embody belonging. They do not want an open society where everyone enjoys the same benefits. Uh, and so where we are today, uh, I really see young people as the key to change because this is their world. We've lived our world and you're living with the results of that. And if 
you're going to have a different world if you're going to be able to live the kind of life that you want to live, then you're going to have to do what we did in the 1960s. You're going to have to fight for that. It has to matter to you enough to do as Dr. King, step out as an individual and try to make the American society your world. Yeah, I'm just sitting with that for a moment because um, one of my foundational questions for this work is how can we get the world that we deserve, one that works for everyone? Yes. And that's a big question, yes. you know, and, and there are no set of instructions for that. Right. And I already know that it doesn't look one way, you know, right. so I often talk about how like there are many lanes to do the work of social change. And we need people in all of those lanes to do that change. Yes. Um, and so it, it feels like it's tangible, and yet it's not tangible at the same time, right. which is the thing that keeps us on the journey, right? right. Going for it. And, um, you know, it's no secret that this journey is hard work. Yes, <laughs> and you and I really talked about it last work. night. Yeah. And it can take a toll on the body and the mind. And um, you have so many experiences and your leaps abound where I am in my journey. And um, I know there's been a research in your activism. Yes. And if you could share what part about that and yeah, and how might that feel different? Well, I wasn't raised to be an activist. Activism is something that came to me because of an experience uh, after I got out of the military. Uh, I was living what I call the playboy's life. I had a car, <laughs> I had an apartment, it was where everybody came to party. <laughs> and uh, that was what I saw as the major part of my life. And uh, a friend of mine that I had gone to school with, uh, we played foot on the football team together. And he got a scholarship to Morehouse. And I went to the military. When I got out of the military, he had graduated from Morehouse four years later, just like I had. But when he came home, he brought black power to Memphis. And that was the last thing I wanted to be de dealing with because, uh, you know, it wasn't about party. <laughs> but uh, <It's> very different. <laughs> one night we were on the way to a party and I had to stop and get gas. And I had stopped at the same, same station previously. And over the course of about a year, I had lost the gas cap each time. And so this same night, the same thing happened. And I had checked to make sure I had a gas cap. So I knew that it was on the car when he came out. So if he had it, it had to be on him. And I looked. And I could see a budge in the side of his shirt. So I reached out and touched it. The thing that I left out is that uh, he was a white guy. White guys were the one that came out and pumped your gas. So I challenged him. And when I touched the gas cap, he threatened to shoot me uh, if he didn't call the police. Well, this is where the story really comes to the point. I had served in the military. I had grown up believing in America. I had taken American history courses. So I felt like I was an American. I, when I went to the military, I saw John Wayne as my hero because of his patriotism and how he, you know, in movies, so that was the guy that I was really trying to emulate. And so when this white guy challenged me, I said, 
No, you don't have to call the police. I'll call the police, because I got rights. I'm an American, and I called them, but I ended up going to jail. And that, for me, brought everything home about being an individual and being an American. This goes back to your theme of belonging. I didn't belong because I could not enjoy the same rights and privileges as white Americans. And that is what motivated me to work to change the system, to change the kind of life that people like me face on a daily basis. So I may not have gotten to the exact point, but again, we come back to the point of individuals. Yeah. And I may be jumping ahead of you, but the dance. Yeah, I was just thinking about you saying that. I was like, it's a dance. That you guys do to me is a reenactment of the dance that each of us do every day in our daily relationships in this society, trying to fit and trying to uh, adjust to things we don't control, which is things beyond us. Your movements are what you control. And this is the way we should approach our situation. Control you and try to make your life what you want out of this society, which is what I did. I decided that America was going to be the kind of country that I wanted to live in if I could get others to join with me and do the same. Yeah. 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 There's the individual, but then there's the power in the collective. Yes. And, and how do we come together? Yeah. This beautiful metaphor, um, and I'm using metaphor because I'm, I'm thinking of last night and how you talked about everything as being a dance. Right. Um, and how you're talking about it, it even transported you back to cause me to reflect on what I'm doing in a different way because you brought up the color line yes. experience and how that, that exchange, if you will, was a way of creating connection. Yeah. Um, and how, you know, I had never held the word color line in my thinking, but I was always talking about working across difference, which is the same thing in so right. many ways. Um, but to that experience that you brought up, you know, um, the give and take, the, um, responsibility is it? What does the work look like? Uh, it, it's super interesting because uh, part of that dreaming space for me is creating a visual yes. of what that work looks like, which then also brings us to another part of our conversation where we talk about, you know, why was it a white male that I chose to be my duet partner? Right. And I was like, well, actually, I want to work with someone different than me. And not only that, maybe that's a thing that we don't see enough you know, right. we see ourselves in silos doing the work on our own, but what does it mean to figure out how to be trying to do that work together? Right. How can that be a reflection of new examples of maybe what we can dream for ourselves in making the change we want to see? Right. Well, that color line idea is something that you guys don't have a, a real feel for. I, at least we talked about back in the 1930s, the colored line was something that existed in white people's heads and enforced on black people. There were places you couldn't go, things you couldn't do. But jazz, in starting in New York, changed a lot of that because 
young white kids wanted to experience the music. They wanted to experience the same spaces. And so when they went to clubs, uh, that was the challenge. They would have to go to Harlem where jazz was. And in going to Harlem, you, you're in a club and basically black people And it's a party. You can't just go, a black guy can't just go up and ask a white girl to dance. But a white girl, if she asks a black guy to dance, she's going against the grain of what society says is possible. So it's like the dance that Everybody was trying to figure out what they could do and how they could uh, bring those, that space together. So this is why I say the colored line existed in white people's head because it was not a physical situation. And as a black guy, you couldn't just walk over and say, dance with me. So it was that kind of dance that you went through trying to figure out, is she gonna say yes or what? And she's trying to figure out the same kind of uh, thing about that, inter that space. How do you close that space is the question, always. How do you reach across that line and touch someone who is different from you? And what does that mean? to the person that you're, you know, are they going to be accept, you know, receptive to your advance or will they reject it? And then there's a whole nother series of thoughts that come to your mind if you are rejected. So this is why I said today in a lot of ways, we're still doing that dance. We have not decided that that land does not exist so everybody is free and open to come together and do whatever. I want to bring it to like a very like simple but not so simple space. Okay. What's your definition of belonging? Access. If you have access, then you don't have to think about not having access. All of your thoughts are about uh, what I can do to, uh, you know, imbue myself with that feeling of being a part. And that is, to me, the uh, critical issue for individuals, whether you're in a workspace or whether you're in an entertainment space, it's how do you, as an individual, what do you feel about it? What do you think about it? Are you second guessing yourself about where you are and what you can do and where you belong? So that word belonging uh, has such a a, a, a total kind of experience for the individual in a society because if you belong, there are no second thoughts. Not, I don't mean just second thoughts on you, but second thoughts on take, partaking in being a part of what others are doing because there's no fear of rejection. And fear of rejection really is the counter to belonging. So there's something about unlearning fear that's essential yes. to doing the work to create a greater sense of belonging. Exactly. Well. Yeah. Hmm. Are there ways in which you're seeing in our society right now that reflect examples of people or of circumstances 
that are getting us to a greater sense of belonging? Well, I'll say there are two events that if, that's happened in America. The death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, changed so much about what we do because anyone who witnessed that eight minutes and 46 seconds could not turn away. Even though you didn't want to see it, even though you didn't want it to happen, you had to watch it. And that was the experience of people around the world. Even New Zealand had marches of 100,000 people. And that's what I saw. I saw young people across America coming together because of that. There was no part of the country that was not touched by the Black Lives Matter movement. And we today are benefiting from that. The other event was COVID-19. COVID changed the world. That was the first time any event touched every part of the world. And we, or at least the press and people talked about getting back to normal. They wanted it over so they could get back to normal. But we're never gonna have that. There's a new normal in this world today. And the new normal is because of young people. They are the ones who will decide whether we will go back or whether we will go forward. So the idea that we're all dancing with now is a about the same thing that this country, this nation has been dancing around since slavery. And so we'll, we will continue to be brought face to face with it and have to make decisions about it until we admit what that was and decide as individuals that we're going to change what we can about it and not reinforce the fear that is being put out there today. The idea is to intimidate, to make you feel fearful of reaching out to someone that's different from you. So you're the key to this conversation and any other conversations now. Where are you on, on your future? Yeah, thank you so much for um, sharing that. Because um, you also have me thinking about your relationship to the past, which you and I share that in common, in that the past, we can't change. It's right. happened. And we can't live there, right? There is something about remembering it revisiting, but we can't live from that place right. because we can't do anything about it. It has already happened. But what we can do is inform the future. And so that question comes up about what is it that we're willing to risk, yeah. right? And I feel like that's what you're talking about, like what is the risk taking? Well, uh, in what you do, I, I see you, the word, that comes to mind most is projection. You've projected out into space 
this thought and you are working to get to that thought. So we have to project the kind of world that we want to live in. We have to project the kind of relationships that we want. And in projecting, that gives you a target to work toward. Because as you say, do the work. You have to work at being someone who can feel comfortable in no matter what environment you're in because you're comfortable with yourself. See, and that fear or racism or whatever is something you project upon the world. You have to come to a place to where you're so comfortable with you that you don't worry about someone else's reaction to how you are and what you want and what you're willing to put your energy behind, which is what the dance is about. The energy that each of us produce and how that, that dance takes place in comfort or in stress. Because if you are not comfortable with yourself, that stress you project onto your partner and that interferes with the relationship. It creates static. So the whole idea is projecting onto the world what you as an individual has produced within you. This is the kind of person I'm going to be. This is the kind of life I'm going to live. And not spend your energy trying to negotiate uh, a false reality, I'll put it like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, there's something about humanity that's um, really solid. You, there's a thing I've been thinking about most recently around um, that thing I'm projecting, if I, if I use the word you offered up, um, around um, what is it that I'm, I'm projecting in terms of that I'm hoping for. Right, mm -hmm. and I can say that some some time ago in my journey, maybe it was about perfection. You know, I wanted to create the perfect world, and but like, there's no such thing as a perfect world, right? And then I'm more recently that space of wellness. What does it mean to create a space that is well yes. for everybody? And now I'm not convinced that's the entire thing either. And now I'm asking if it's about wholeness. How do mm -hmm. I make myself whole? Right. in this journey, which might also create another avenue for inspiring and are, if someone's getting that energy, then mm -hmm. they have something to feed off of to find their way to wholeness as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious about, you know, what do you feel about this idea of wellness versus wholeness, like the whole being? Yeah. Well, I think wellness and wholeness or partners in this, because you can't have one without the other. Uh, we started the conversation of, about Dr. King. And in that last hour, two hours of his life, that we set in the Lorraine and talked about uh, his need for us to help him with the Poor People's Campaign. And most people talk about the speech that Dr. King gave the night before. Everyone calls it the mountaintop speech. And because of that speech, a, a, a lot of people, again, believe he had some premonition of what was going to happen to him. And the thing that has always bothered me about that is if he had a premonition, 
Why did he spend the last two hours of his life talking to me and Charles? We were nobodies. We didn't have any power. And that has, has really made me try and see what's in me. That brought me there for that interface that day. And I still don't have the answer to that, but what I draw from his life and his work is that everybody has the opportunity to create change. And he was not just important because he was Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He was important because he brought change with him. And so I have to accept the, that last meeting as my invitation to be a change maker to continue to try and make a difference in situations where it may seem hopeless, but as long as you're pushing against that, there's hope. There's hope that we can change America. There's hope that we can save democracy. There's hope that our children, your children, will have a better world to live in and exist than the world you're living in now. The choice is with you as to whether that world is going to be better or worse. That's your choice, not their choice, because they'll find themselves, if we continue on this path, sitting in a room, something like this today, listening to some guy tell them about what their responsibility is, how they can change, and what they need to do. Do you feel that invitation is a connection to what keeps you going right now? Say that again? The, his, the invitation that you sensed from spending time with Dr. King before uh -huh. he passed, do you feel like that's part of the thing that's con allowing you to keep going right now in your journey? Yes. Uh, See, I didn't know Dr. King. I didn't work with him. I wasn't one of his disciples. That day was the first day that I met him. And so what I knew about him before that day was what I read in the paper or saw on TV. I was not one of his disciples. I wasn't even one of his uh, people in, in his uh, entourage or any of that. So what we shared that day was uh, a genuineness because I was not convinced before that meeting that Dr. King really thought about us as a uh, valuable to his effort. The, the word out was that the invaders were uh, thugs and uh, you know, hoodlums. And as I said, other civil rights leaders didn't really want to have anything to do with us. So I went into the meeting with a great deal of skepticism, not about him as a person, but whether or not he was genuinely serious about us being a part of what he was trying to do, because like I said, we were nobodies. We had a neighborhood organization that we created that we got involved with because uh, people that lived in our neighborhood and other neighborhoods, they were sanitation workers. I knew sanitation workers. 
I knew some of their children. So it was not like we came from out of town someplace and we was just trying to help out. We were just trying to help our neighbors and friends. These guys worked for $1.75 an hour. They couldn't use the showers. They couldn't get sick leave or overtime pay or vacation. When, it, when the weather was inclement, rain or something like that, they sent them home without pay. Whereas the white workers, they, they went back to the locker room and sit on the clock until the day was over or until the weather got better. They had showers. Black workers could not shower after picking up garbage all day and it wasting on them and things like that. They went home smelling like their jobs because they couldn't. And if you were riding a bus or something like that and a garbage worker got on the bus, you knew because the whole bus smelled like garbage. So what we were doing was what I felt was helping the garbage workers. It wasn't really about helping the civil rights movement. Uh, and when I got involved, they, was have, they would have meetings nightly in the community about how to, what was gonna happen. And a lot of the, their children and the friends of their children came to the meeting. And so because we were working in the neighborhood as invaders, they came to me wanting to know what could they do to help because they weren't a part of the uh, official activity. And so that's how we got involved in the strike, not because of the people who were running the strike wanted us, they didn't even want us to be involved because we were black power and they didn't want any part of that. So it was the children and the friend and their friends. And this was 1967. I was 24 years old. Most of the kids were high schoolers, 10th graders, 11th graders, 12th graders. They were the ones that were really doing the protesting and activity. So I was just trying to help out from a community standpoint of view. And this is why today I still speak to young people because I know the power that you have. I know that change very seldom comes from the older generation because they're comfortable. They like what they're doing. They're gonna continue to do that. But it is pressure from the younger generation that always drive them to the left. So. I feel like you've just redefined the experience for <laughs> these generations. And that is like, get comfortable in the discomfort, you know, <laughs> um, to push, you know, yeah. um, to not settle. Um, I have a couple of sentence stems for you uh, that I would like to share. And before I offer those, I want to say, like, I'll use these sentence stems as a way to also transition to open up this conversation um, to a Q&A space where you can ask questions to either John or myself um, for this next portion of the process, uh, which was something I was supposed to say earlier, but I didn't. <laughs> so. Uh, so anyway, these sentence stems, I'll just, the first one. Just wondering how you complete the sentence. I feel a sense of connection when? Say that again. I feel a sense of connection when? Oh. I feel a sense of connection uh, when I get a smile. That young lady there got a beautiful smile. <laughs> Inconsistent. <laughs> that, that, because it opens you up. It relaxes the face 
from inside. So when I encounter people, I always want to have a smile. And I know if I get that smile back, I can approach. Yeah. But if I don't get that smile, then I know. Uh, Maybe not. Know about <laughs> this. <laughs> oh, no. Awesome. To belong. To belong? To belong. Oh. To belong is the energy. You know, the, the, the energy you feel when you walk into a room. You know, it's, it's that feeling that I can approach again. I can participate. I don't have to uh, get permission. You know, belonging results from you wanting to be there. You wanting to be a part of that. You're willing to contribute. You want to be comfortable. My third one, <laughs> right now I feel. Right now I feel. Right now I feel relieved. <laughs> and the reason I feel relieved is that Everybody here has been very attentive. No rustling, you know, no leaving the room. Uh, and I know I'm always uh, not tense before I, uh, you know, face a crowd, because uh, uh, you never know what the reception is going to be. So there's always a certain amount of tension there. And again, smiles help out. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Um, so now I'd love to open up the floor for any questions or comments from any of you for either John or myself um, as an extension of, of this. Yeah. You got to, I can't hear him too well. He need a mic. Yeah, we need a mic. Yeah. Hi, you, um, my name is PJ. It's a pleasure. You talked about George Floyd being a pivotal moment. I just borrowed Louise's phone. You cannot find the famous horrible image of Emmett Till on Google. It is literally erased from the consciousness. And most folks don't know who Emmett Till is. And I say, you can't have a conversation without, mm -hmm. about George Floyd with Emmett Till. At another metaphor, I was so excited that the construct of the Black Panther was being popularized, but not connected. Mm -hmm. You know, I looked at the 10-point program. There's about five points integrated into that movie, but there was no historical reference. And so my question is, how do we not forget the past, and how do we invite the next generation to see the connectivity of the movement and the shoulders that we're standing on? Well, your, your, your comments began with uh, Emmett Till. And I was 14 when Emmett Till was killed. And I was born in Mississippi. I grew up between Memphis and Mississippi. My folks uh, escaped Mississippi under the cover of night. And, uh, but even growing up in Mississippi, I was not uh, fearful. I grew up, the area I grew up in was heavily, you know, white people owned the land, but 
the sharecroppers were black. And so I hadn't experienced the, that kind of racism, that kind of hatred. Uh, I never saw any Ku Klux Klan or any of that in, in the area that I grew up in. So my attitude toward Mississippi was kind of benign. But when Emmett Till was murdered, I became fearful of Mississippi for the first time because I didn't realize that that kind of hatred and malice really existed. And Emmett Till's death changed uh, so much of the world. If, you know, but it was something that happened to black people and black people in the South, more or less. Uh, George Floyd's uh, murder was, was so different to me because of the reaction of young white people. It was, to be honest, Coming into that period, I was not very active. I was uh, dormant, so to speak. But seeing all those young people in the streets daily over the death of a black man gave me real hope and a desire to become a part of what they were doing. I didn't really know exactly what it was they were, other than I, you know, I identified with the marches and all of that, but I had no idea where that was going to lead. So it brought me to a place to where I knew I had to get involved again. And so I began to write to try and... Uh, help young people understand the, the change that they were bringing about. And so I don't know whether I answer your question uh, satisfactorily, but the inspiration that young people represent to me is the hope that we could do things that will keep us from reliving that past. We will never be able to put it out of our mind, but we don't have to relive it. We can change it. Is, is, Mm -hmm. um, you have me thinking about accountability, like, you know, in this actioning forward, what does it mean for us to um, make sure our histories are told the way they are, mm -hmm. the stories the way they are really happening? Um, because the journey has perhaps been one where histories have been erased. Mm -hmm. And so how do we hold space and hold people accountable for not erasing those stories and saying those stories actually create the true American story. Mm -hmm. Another question? Anybody? <laughs> you need to stay here and wait on the mic. I also want to thank you, can you hear me, for being here. Um, my name's Rosa. I had a question um, I was thinking about when you were talking about um, young white people getting out into the streets and being really outraged by George Floyd's murder, um, Dr. King's letters from a Birmingham jail and the discussion of the white moderate. Um, and why do you connect that to progress being made of white people being more engaged in the struggle for racial justice? Um, and what do you think has led to that progress? 
Tough question. <laughs> On the subject, not an yeah. answer, obviously. Uh, back in 1972, well, I'll say uh, 68, Richard Nixon ran for president. And the Democrats had uh, uh, Hubert Humphrey. And Humphrey lost, and Richard Nixon came to the White House. Well, activists realized that the only way we were going to really be able to change the world or America was that we had to expand the electorate. So this is when we all started working on the 26th Amendment, which gave young people 18 the right to vote. And when we, get, when we did that, we wasn't sure what was going to happen in terms of the change that it was going to bring about. And it really didn't do anything too much for a while because of how the older generation responded to it. And in 2020, as I said, when I got involved again, I started to communicate with young people. And the theme that I ran was, you have to turn your street protests into street politics because that's where you have the power. And I keep coming back to the idea that young people are the future. If you uh, spend your time thinking about anything other than the future, you're wasting your time. What's happening now in politics is not going to change unless you want it to change. You need education. You need student loan debt erased. You need to have an idea of the kind of jobs that's going to be out there. You need health care. Women need access to abortion. All of these things are things that the older generation doesn't really care about as a whole because they are looking at budgets and influence and things like that. You're the ones who are going to live in that world. Most of them in five years, if they're not passed on, they're going to be inactive. But they are the ones that are controlling the world today. You have to see it as your world. The, the, the invaders, the way that name came about was that there was a a program on TV called The Invaders. And it was about aliens that came from out of space to the Earth because they wanted to make this their world. And the guy that came up with The Invaders thing, Danny Delaney, that was his idea that we should be invaders because we have to make this our world. And that thing continues to drive me, you know, because if we don't make it our world, it's going to remain their world. And so you guys are invaders.
Hi, Mr. Smith. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience with us. I actually, I found it really interesting when you were talking about how I didn't know that Martin Luther King was actually like on the upper bound of the middle class, and he went to the best school. So I wanted to know if the upper bound of the black middle class felt the same injustices and inequalities that um, were felt by the poorer people in the 60s and 70s? No. See, that was the thing that made the difference about Dr. King. He shouldn't have cared like they didn't care. Now, what made him care, I can't really say, but when, when he won the Nobel Peace Prize, the middle class leaders saw him becoming for the lack of a better comparison, a guy like Jesse Jackson, where you go to the corporate boardrooms and you speak to white people and the business people and get money to, you know, and things like that. And that's what they expected of him. But he did just the opposite. The first thing he did was he came out against the Vietnam War. And that uh, really uh, pissed a lot of people off, especially J. Edgar Hoover. And so from that, he started to embrace young people because they were the ones going to the war like I went and died. And so that was another, you know, his push was to stop that. And the civil rights leaders, that's when they made the statements about uh, him betraying his class and that even if the, uh, you know, they do things to help the poor, it, it was not going to help them, because civil rights, which most people don't know, civil rights was about middle class goals. You know, getting good jobs, moving into the white neighborhoods, going to school with white children, all of these things needed to be done, true enough. But that was their goal. A better society really was not their goal, which is what Dr. King was looking at. How do we make this a society where everyone can participate and enjoy. So he, or exactly why he made his change to, I, I can't say, but his, which is a part of that uh, conversation that we had at the Lorraine, uh, I don't know whether it had any effect on me or not, but he, we were talking, if you've ever been to the Lorraine, it's a regular motel room. It's got double beds and a table with a lamp and a little thing in the middle. And Dr. King sat on one bed and Charles and I sat on the other bed. And so we were talking back and forth about why he needed us to help with the Poor People's Campaign and the response. And uh, I was reluctant because I didn't, I didn't really know him. And at one point he reached over and he touched me on, put his hand on my knee, and he said that he needed us because he didn't have anybody else. And that if we didn't help, 
then what was going to happen to the poor? And I, this is why I compare him to Jesse Jackson, because I really felt he was genuine, that he was not giving us a sales pitch in order to get us to help him. He really wanted to continue to work for the poor. And it was, I guess, 30, 40 minutes after that that he was assassinated. And the whole effort to help the poor, really, uh, they continued with the process, but they did not keep the same goals and the same uh, ideas that Dr. King had. So uh, I don't know what made him so committed, but I, I know he was committed because of that whole group of civil rights leaders. He was the only one on the side that we were on. And we were on the side of the poor and, and the people. Okay. Question for you. In your work across difference, have you felt geography play into that significantly based on, you've now been to five different cities? Is that right? Uh, four states. Four states. Four states and then five different, and you know, of course, Denver is, is, that's part of this process that we're in now. What's the most significant um, experience you've had across difference ge geographically through this project of stitching and sewing the country back together? And what was that experience like? No, okay, so I'm going to give this question to John. <laughs> ah, no! I think he has an answer for me. I think he has no! an answer for me. Based on our conversation last night, he definitely has an answer for me. <laughs> um, that's a great question, only uh, because I think every place we've been thus far is unique in its own way and um, impactful and, um, and touching and... Um, gripping in a way that lets me know that there's a hunger for, the, for change. There's a hunger for something different. Um, and there's also reorientation, which is a word I like to use a lot. And that reorientation is um, one where stereotypes fall away as you move into different geographies because there are, there's a way in perhaps the general we, we can hold what might be the thinking of a certain person from a certain area. And then you get to that area and you realize that that is not the thinking whatsoever. Um, and so that reorientation is, uh, does a thing. But I would say to some more tangible, significant things that have happened along the way, um, you know, our first experience in northern Michigan, which I, I use as sort of like an anchor for me every time, and that's maybe because it was our first experience, um, began with a six-hour experience uh, where we were oriented to the land via an indigenous history tour. And it culminated with a belonging conversation that it facilitated where we didn't know if anybody would show up or who would show up, and 25 people were waiting for us for our conversation. And that two-week journey on the back end and, and through all the things that happened along the way um, the work became a portal for bridging um, the general community, which is a pretty homogenous community with indigenous members of the community, um, and raising a different kind of awareness um, around National Boarding School Day um, and um, the collective nature of work to bring indigenous history into public education. Um, in a more intimate situation, actually in an area in, in Colorado State, um, and, and actually this one was referenced in the film, um, we experienced two longtime residents of uh, Lafayette, Colorado, um, be, in this, be positioned where they could 
address each other and where someone can express that they felt an action of racism against them and that it could be heard and an apology was offered in return. Um, and that one moment was about one situation, one situation being healed, but it was like the beginning of many situations. So I, yeah, and that's only two, but I think the work um, is holding a space for um, big things, for lack of a better way to say it, to happen. That is way beyond my control and way beyond my wildest dreams, but it is something I hope for because I'm, I'm, I'm invested in finding and creating opportunities for healing and uniting. Thank you for saying that, Thank Louise. You. Yeah, Thank and you. I, yeah, and you know, our chance meeting was last yeah. year while you were here, right. and I came to see the Invaders documentary, and the, the funny story that I shared with John B. last night was that, you know, well, actually, before, on the phone, when we, made, uh, we talked for the first time, I was like, yeah, we maybe only saw each other for 15 seconds because I was too shy, and I was just overwhelmed by like all of this information, and I was like super inspired, and all I could say was thank you, and I was out the door. And so then John B. goes like, were you the person that was blah, 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 and standing by the door? I'm like, yeah, I was that person. <laughs> and so he remembered me in those 15 seconds. So, yeah. But not knowing John B., I would say that everything that I do is very much about being on the shoulders of giants like you. Um, I would not be able to do this without individuals like you who have done this work. So Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I like to thank you guys. You've been a beautiful audience. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better audience. I need to carry you guys with me everywhere I go. Yes, yeah, so um, as a, a, an extended invitation, John B. and I will be here on Wednesday um, along with Ryder, who's actually in the audience and I'm just get your attention, it's my duet partner. Mm -hmm. um, it's really amazing to work with him. Uh, we will be together doing a, a conversation, uh, a brown bag lunch conversation here on Wednesday at 11.30. Um, and yes, means bring your lunch. <laughs> and we will uh, engage in more conversations around this theme of belonging and um, dreaming of a better future, a different future. Um, and we would love for you to join us if you're so available. Um, there is a sign-up sheet that will be available, and we're just asking for your names and your email addresses. Um, but we'd love to have you there. Um, and as a closing, I would say that our, uh, thank you so much. Thank you to Louise and Redline for hosting this. Um, thank you to John B., my new friend. Um, I'm so, so grateful. And uh, this one gem that I received from another artist that has now become something I carry with me as I continue this journey is that America is not a melting pot, it's a mosaic. <laughs> it's about differences being on the side of each other, being stitched together to create that new space. So um, I invite us all to step into our truths and our differences and find ways to coexist. Thank you so much. Okay.